When it comes to black holes, I've always been fascinated by the idea that, in theory, astrophysicists are able to predict what they actually look like way before we can even see them. As a matter of fact, even though the first black hole picture ever was released in 2019, the original simulation showing us what black holes might look like, which is this beautiful image you see on the screen, was originally produced uh, literally 40 years prior, back in 1979, by the relatively famous French astronomer Jean-Pierre Luminet. And interestingly, this first computer simulation was produced by nothing more but a really early computer and a bunch of ink. Now, 40 years later, we finally have a confirmation of his ideas, but obviously there were some inconsistencies, and you can actually find out more about Luminet and his creation, along with some of the inconsistencies from other simulations, by reading the blog he wrote a few years ago. Anyway, hello wonderful person. So today I actually wanted to focus on another interesting theoretical prediction and theoretical simulation of binary black holes. And this was recently produced by two NASA scientists using a supercomputer that's normally used for various simulations usually involving climate. The two scientists, Jeremy Schnittman and Brian Powell, use this supercomputer that you see right here, known as Discover, to essentially simulate what we can expect to discover if there are two supermassive black holes in orbit around one another. Which of course follows this tradition, at least when it comes to black holes and other mysterious objects, where you kind of start with a theory, then you try to visualize it using computers or a lot of mathematics, and lastly you try to confirm your theory by actually finding real objects somewhere out there, and then seeing if your theory actually matches what you get to see. And for the picture of M87, the theory matched the observations almost entirely. There were some discrepancies, very minor ones, mostly because apparently we were observing this black hole when it was extremely quiet, but overall what the scientists expected to see, they actually did see after all. And so traditionally when it comes to a lot of these exotic objects like black holes and neutron stars, the observations have pretty much always matched the previous theoretical predictions. Which is why trying to push the theoretical boundaries and trying to simulate even more advanced objects is so important. But in this case, the scientists decided to focus on the idea of two supermassive black holes, one being about 200 million masses of the Sun, and the other one being a little bit smaller, 100 million masses of the Sun. And the point of the simulation was essentially to predict what we're going to be able to see if, or hopefully when, one day we discover these objects in a galaxy somewhere far away. But first of all, let's try to understand why this is important. So when it comes to black holes, we know that these so-called stellar mass black holes are pretty much everywhere, and we've actually detected quite a lot of them, including a lot of them in collision with one another. That's generally what the Caltex LIGO detector is able to do really well. We've also obviously found quite a lot of supermassive black holes out there, with some really sort of breaking the limits of our understanding. But we've never really seen two supermassive black holes relatively close to one another. We've seen galaxies that do possess two or three supermassive black holes at really far away distances, here we're talking about thousands of light years apart, but we've never seen two really close. Specifically close enough where they start influencing one another and where the light interaction and specifically the gravitational lensing interaction actually starts to become an issue. And it's really important to one day find these objects because currently our theoretical explanation for how black holes grow and how galaxies basically kind of grow as well does involve galactic collisions and black holes merging. But there is a small problem with supermassive black holes. It's a paradox, it's known as the final parsec problem. The idea that if the black holes, supermassive black holes, come really close to each other, specifically about four light years away from each other, at this point it's going to be really difficult for them to come any closer. They're still too far away from each other to produce any gravitational waves that normally slow down black holes, and they're a little bit too close for various types of materials such as interstellar gas to try to slow them down further, so they basically kind of get stuck in this region. And so, for example, in galaxies like this, where there seem to be two supermassive black holes in the middle, these black holes are still much farther away. And so, we've never really seen galaxies where the black holes are really, really close to one another. Specifically this close. 
but they have to exist. At least um, that's our understanding of how galaxies evolve. If these galaxies don't exist, if there are no galaxies where black holes are so close together, then something is wrong with our understanding of black hole evolution and galactic evolution. And so because of this, it's also important to understand what we can expect from a galaxy where two supermassive black holes are orbiting really close to one another. We have to understand for example, what type of different sort of light we're going to see, what sort of light interaction, what kind of different effects we're going to be seeing here, which would be absent if there was just one black hole. And so these simulations are absolutely crucial in order for us to analyze what exactly happens when, for example, two supermassive black holes sort of cross each other. So we're going to be seeing these very unique observations in these uh, systems, but we're not going to be seeing this anywhere else. So that's kind of why this is important. Now, first of all, the assumption here is that these two black holes both have some sort of um, relatively large accretion disk, like this black hole here, and they also both emit somewhat similar light. But in this case, most of the spectrum is not optical, it's actually ultraviolet light. So sort of what we expect from really large hot stars. With the blue disk, the blue black hole here, emitting slightly higher in terms of temperatures, uh, UV emissions. And for both black holes, we also get to see a very clearly defined shadow of the black hole right in the middle with a really, really small ring right here that you can also find in this image from NASA known as the photon ring. And that's essentially where the photons sort of start orbiting the black hole and in some sense actually get stuck there. They can orbit the black hole two, three, four or actually multiple times simply because in this particular region, it's possible for light to assume an orbit around the black hole. But because of the slight distortions, some of the light does get to escape at some point. But unlike previous observations, here we also get to see what happens when one black hole passes in front of the other. Notice how the light from the black hole in the back actually gets to be reflected on both sides of the black hole in front. And then something similar happens when the smaller black hole passes in front of the larger black hole. And this of course means that if one day we discover some sort of a galaxy where we actually see these unusual emissions that do suggest some sort of a mirroring effect coming from the center and these emissions seem to repeat very regularly, it of course means that we definitely found some kind of a massive object orbiting another massive object. But for now we haven't found them so we're just going to keep looking. But the other really interesting observation here is usually referred to as relativistic aberration. This is essentially when the black holes actually kind of appear smaller as they approach us, but become slightly larger when they move away from us. So right now, as the blue black hole approaches us, it actually kind of shrinks in size. Whereas as the red black hole moves away, it looks bigger in size. And that's essentially the consequence of moving really, really close to the speed of light and the effects that the black holes themselves create in their vicinity. You can actually find more cool examples in regards to this on this site created by Andrew Hamilton of Colorado University, where he actually has some really cool examples of the uh, relativistic aberration, like the one you see right here where the object, even though it's approaching us, kind of appears smaller for just a little bit right before it comes toward us, which is more or less the same reason why it sort of looks the same in this simulation here as well. The other interesting and unusual phenomenon in this case is somewhat difficult to see at first, but it's basically the fact that both of the black holes produce a kind of a copy or in some sense a sort of a reflection of their own partner somewhere inside of the light that's coming from them. Now notice how this uh, blue black hole here is going to sort of shift around, but it's still going to be always there. And something similar is going to happen with the blue black hole with the copy of the red black hole on the inside. And all of these copies of their partners are essentially seen edge on. Or basically, it's the image that's been redirected by about 90 degrees. So in this case, the image that we're looking at is the image of that particular partner, but from a side view. And so here, if this is the front, then this is actually the side view coming from this direction. Which of course is really impressive because it means that if one day we discover this system, we'll be able to analyze a typical supermassive black hole from several different angles at once. Or essentially the system here allows us to kind of recreate the three-dimensional space of the entire black hole. But that's of course assuming that we are sort of positioned in just the right way where the black holes are circling around one another facing us side on. But obviously their positioning could be different. And in this case they simulate those as well. So if for example we're looking at these black holes from the top, we're going to be seeing slightly different effects. 
And so no matter what angle we're going to be looking at these black holes from, we're going to expect some sort of a reflection coming from the accretion disk of the partner. And once in a while when they align just perfectly, we're going to be able to see several different versions of the image from different angles and showing us different perspectives of the black hole. In this case, it's even possible to align the black holes in just the right way, where they basically literally recreate the three-dimensional image of their partner. Although in this case, these images are going to be very distorted. But today we actually have several techniques to recreate these um, distorted images created by gravitational effects and to then try to form the original image knowing what we know about the gravitational lensing. So technically, using a supercomputer, all of this should be possible really quick. Although on a typical computer, such as the one I'm using to record this, even simulating these two black holes orbiting around one another would take close to about a decade. And so overall, this is actually a pretty impressive and really important simulation that a lot of scientists studying black holes are going to be using for many years to come. There are obviously some other effects that I haven't covered here. For example, relativistic beaming that both black holes produce as well. And that's the Doppler shift effect where this side right here is going to be a little bit brighter than the opposite side. This is true for both black holes. That's basically because the light in the accretion disk is moving toward us, so it's slightly brighter. And on the other side, it's moving away from us, so it's going to be slightly Doppler shifted and appear slightly darker. I think the original Luminez image is a much better example of this effect in action, so you can kind of see how this is much brighter and there's almost nothing here. So definitely quite an amazing visualization and quite an amazing theoretical prediction of what we can observe once we discover these objects. But for now, the scientists are going to keep looking. It's probably one of the biggest unsolved mysteries of the universe, the mystery being, do supermassive black holes collide ever? or do they grow by some other means we haven't really figured out yet? I mean, clearly there are binary black holes in some galaxies, but what happens to them at the end? And so hopefully by using these simulations and by comparing this to real observations, we'll be able to answer this maybe in the next few years. But until then, check out the simulation and all of the relevant links in the description below. Subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, thank you for watching, stay wonderful, and as always, bye-bye.